Welcome to today's panel. Hello, everyone who just joined and welcome. We're going to get started in just two minutes or so, just allowing everyone to log into Zoom. Welcome again, Walid. We love to see you every day. Hey, Walid. He keeps coming back. That must mean these are excellent panels, right? All right, well, we are broadcasting live and a few more people are logging in, but I think we can go ahead and get started with the intros. So with that, I will pass it off to our MC, Mr. Dan Garfield. All right, welcome everybody to uh, the final day of the KubeCon debrief. Uh, I've decided that this show is now unofficially called The Hallway Track, your chance to catch up on the hallway discussion that you missed by attending the event in person. We are going to wrap up KubeCon EU, cover our favorite talks, look at the technology on display at the conference, and I will eat crow at some point. So welcome, welcome, and we will get right into it. First, I want to introduce our panelists. We have the uh, legendary Alex Williams. Alex Williams is, of course, famous for making pancakes. Almost every conference I go to, he's making pancakes to serve up, uh, which is just fabulous. Welcome, Alex. It's all about the stack, Dan. It's all about the stack. I should say you're the, the founder and publisher of the new stack as well. So <laughs> that's true. All that is <laughs> yes, you all got that, that right. So you can, uh, you know, as we like to say, Next, next pancake breakfast, come have a short stack with the new stack. That's our <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we also have Ellen Corbis uh, from Tilt, who was, of course, a speaker at KubeCon and uh, kind of a late invite. We just uh, was able to connect with you yesterday, invited you, and you were very nice enough to accommodate us. Uh, and even even though you you know you had to join from the car, which is just incredibly nice of you to do, and uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Dan. Um, I, I think it was really cool that we, we got the idea to, basically, I think you got the idea for me to join the panel from a discussion we were having on Twitter. So uh, we can continue uh, yelling at each oh other, God. but now, uh, you know, with video and voice. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> exactly, hopefully. Um, Austin Parker coming to us from Lightstep. Austin, you've actually done a few different uh, projects with CodeFresh in the last few months. Yeah, I've done a couple webinars. Um, with enthusiasm. With enthusiasm, yeah. <laughs> no, my my brain stopped. I think I had to. <laughs> I had to have some vertical pod auto scaling going on in my brain yeah. there. <laughs> oh, great. Start that pod. Uh, and then, of course, Matt Baldwin, who is our three P panelist extraordinaire, who joins us uh, from NetApp, and of course, uh, a legend in his own right of the Kubernetes community. Hey, everybody. All right, so uh, first topic of discussion um, I wanted to get into is actually um, this uh, this conversation that Priyanka was having. Priyanka sat down and had a kind of a press junket along with a few other CNCF folks. And she said, it's likely that by 2025, two thirds of enterprises will be prolific open source software producers and over 90% of new apps will be net cloud native. Um, basically, she was pointing out that uh, because of, uh, dang it, how do I talk about this? So for, for those of you who are on the stream, just so you know, there's a certain event going on in the world that if we discuss, makes it so these videos don't get promoted by YouTube later. So uh, we will call it the illness that shall not be named. Um, so. Uh, Priyanka was saying that the illness that shall not be named is actually driving people into open source faster and that they're seeing a big acceleration of enterprises contributing to open source. What does the panel think about that? Is that what you're seeing? Um, do you think her estimate uh, is, of two thirds is conservative? Is it too aggressive? 
90% of apps cloud native by uh, in just five years. What are the thoughts? I'm going to jump in real quick. I'll, I'll jump in first. I, I think the day, I think it's an aggressive timeline. Um, you know, when we, if we're talking about enterprises, if we wanted to find that as, are we talking about traditional enterprises? Doubtful that two thirds of them will be prolific software, uh, OSS software producers, you know, um, by 2025 is what I challenge. Um, I think we're going to see some really, I, I think, I think you, you exactly think it'll only be 60% rather than 66%. It just no, because uh, having been part of a, a big corporation uh, as an enterprise, um, things move a lot slower in these organizations. Um, a lot of these enterprise organizations have uh, committees that open source initiatives have to pass through for approval. Um, when you're going to go and say, I want to contribute to uh, Kubernetes, you have to go through an approval process to do that. And then there's an approval process for your uh, contribution going in sometimes to ensure that there's no IP that's flowing out from the company into, into these open source projects. So they're very, you know, so any company that I think is legacy traditional enterprise is gonna have a hard time playing in the open source world. New companies I think are doing a lot better job, but there are some traditional, like large companies, very large companies are doing open source. So I don't wanna diminish their, their contributions, but I think traditional companies are are going to have a hard time becoming contributors to OSS projects or producers of their own OSS. The engineering management is just not, I don't, I, as far as I can tell, the engineering management of open source projects is still largely a mystery. And for that reason, in part, I don't see this positive outlook really proving itself. We do see far more people in, investing their time in open source projects now. And we've talked to several people about that, but the engineering management is still has a long way to go to even understand open source, how GitHub works, how, you know, how you kind of think about all these different processes and workflows and how you manage the people internally. And the business doesn't understand why they should be yeah. doing this. Right. What do you think Austin? To take a slightly different tack. I mean, I think it's an aggressive number, but I also think it's a number that, like most numbers that you get out of these sort of speculative things, it's, you know, it doesn't matter because it all matters in how you count, right? I don't think we should interpret this as 90%, you know, that there's going to be some sudden groundswell in existing applications being rebuilt as cloud native. Um, and I also don't think that what you're going to see is suddenly the the enterprise software development life cycle suddenly becomes more accommodating to the vagaries of, you know, maintain, interacting inside of an open source project. What I think you'll see is more sort of point solutions, right? Um, I think what you'll see is large enterprises deciding they want to build rather than buy and using the, you know, if, if you look at sort of the arc of CNCF and the projects that are coming into it, we've moved for, one step away from providing sort of this base layer of technology and now what you're seeing are more projects that are kind of like either specialized distributions on top of that or, or sort of components and other ways that you can you know it's go it's like starting out with a you know a toolbox and you have a wrench and you have like two sockets and now we're adding more sockets in right so now that you have all these different sizes of sockets it's more possible to kind of go and build your own version of whatever off the shelf thing um and because if there's one thing when i think enterprise i think it's not invented here right like people don't want to either they don't want to or, or they they do due to financial reasons or just culture reasons, they're not going to just pick off the shelf solutions for things. So what I think you will see are a lot of teams in the enterprise creating new platforms built on top of, you know, CNCF projects on top of open source projects. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can see that with the observability stuff, especially, which we can talk more about later. Yeah, I agree. We, we actually will have uh, uh, some time to talk about Thanos um, in a little bit. But I, I'll actually be a little bit more bullish. I really like that Priyanka is setting this high bar vision for people to be thinking about. I've noticed a big thaw in very large companies that have never contributed to open source before now starting that practice. I think it's a prestige play. I look at a lot of companies who are saying, cool engineers don't want to work for us. 
how do we attract them? And you know what, if we have some cool open source projects, maybe they'll be into it. If we give back to the community, the community will give back to us. You know, it feels like a win-win. I think maybe a better way of looking at this is companies that do move towards this route will survive by 2025, you know, while companies that choose to mm. not go this route will slowly find themselves alone in the cold with no yeah. friends and no culture and effectively the company going under or going into investment. But I, mm -hmm. I also want to like make a, a sidebar there. I think the culture answer doesn't hold as much water in a post disease that shall not be named world. Um, looking at, you know, the amount of layoffs that have happened and will continue to happen. I, I think it's going to be another 2001 or another 2008 where just a lot of people leave the tech market. Right. And it, it moved very quickly from a, you know, employee employees market to a employer's market where now, you know, everyone try, is trimming a lot of fat and probably will continue to as stuff happens. Um, I, I don't know if there's going to be the situation where it's like, oh, big financial companies have to be cool. I think what they what they all have is the promise of a steady paycheck and, you know, a, a company that's not going to go under. I do think, though, that you'll see more internal OSS, you'll see more like intrapreneurial things where you have these little like, you know, uh, cloud excellence, you know, uh, there's been the, the cloud excellence center or whatever in a lot of place enterprises. So yeah. now you'll see the open source excellence center, right? And here's the 100 person BU that goes off and um, works in, does upstream contributions to Kubernetes or whatever. Kind of like a capital one type of situation where they're yeah sure I, I don't know what this what our stance is on like dr name dropping things right uh, i don't want to cut, cut the conversation too short but i do want to move on to our next topic is uh yeah. there is still quite a bit of news so we'll move on if that's all right um another piece of news coming out yesterday that i noticed and i don't know if this was officially posted yesterday or was a little bit before that but uh helm two to helm three now that's a migration that's taking on a little bit more urgency now. I think that they announced that security updates will be provided through November, but that the last update to Helm 2 was August 14th. Um, I just came this morning from the Helm developer call where uh, they were discussing the fact that the images for Tiller, for example, are currently hosted on GCR and that that will be shut down uh, by, uh, I believe, before the end of the year, which means uh, migration is all the more important um, any thoughts on that? And uh, and get, are are a lot of people still on Helm two, or most people jumped uh, jumped over? We're at Helm three. I think, I think we're moving to Helm three. I'd have to go talk to our um, SREs. I personally think it's, I mean it's great. Like I think Helm three is a pleasure to use comparatively, and it's a lot easier to kind of set up and also just to, as like an introductory, an introductory point to this, I, I think Helm 2 had a lot of, I don't want to say cruft, but um, the less steps it takes, you know, there's there's a movement towards that. I think you saw that with uh, Istio, right? Where they kind of went down to a single binary. I think Helm going to like a single binary. It's just like reduce the, you know, reduce the surface area, reduce the amount of stuff that someone has to deal with to get started. And that's, a play for success. Alex, we haven't heard from you uh, in a little bit. Yeah, we interviewed uh, uh, the team from from Helm um, just recently, and one of the things that just need to you know cite is just the size of the of the Helm community overall. It's really quite big, and they really needed to kind of take that next step to, you know, serve that, you know, that, that base community. Um, part of the challenges I think that they face is like, a, like, a, like a lot of these communities as they get, as they get very large, it's like, how are you serving these customers who are these users who are uh, both new, but also maybe have been using Helm for a while. And uh, maybe someone can help refresh me on the new, what are some of the new uh, features that are in Helm oh. 3 that, 
speak yeah. to this. I'm... Helm three gets rid of Tiller and That's Tiller the is the server side component of Helm. Right. And the, the main thing that slowed down the adoption of Helm was the fact that you had to have a server side component, which essentially had root access to your cluster. And so it was a big security concern from day one. Uh, I've noticed that in Europe, European companies tend to be much more prolific Helm users. Um, for example, at this talk, at this conference, there were over 22 talks that involved Helm, uh, which is which is the most prolific of all the topics that I was able to check. Um, so Helm is incredibly popular for sure. And the, the removal of Tiller, uh, personally, I view it as, as the, um, the big catalyst that's actually going to drive the adoption forward that slowed this project down before. And I don't know, Ellen, uh, do you have any thoughts on the Helm to two to three transition? Yeah, um, I've heard a lot. So I'm, I, my, my niche here is basically the development side, right? The tooling side. And everyone always wanted to do stuff with Tilt. Or, sorry. Helm. <laughs> everyone always wanted to do stuff with Helm. Yeah. Um, and, and Tiller was always, um, it was always like, a, what's the English expression? Like a rock inside your shoe. Um, it was always causing trouble. Uh, like at, at, at companies I worked and with uh, developers I, I was close with, always Tiller was always causing trouble. Um, universally, everyone in that niche of like uh, into tool integration and that kind of stuff, everyone that I talk to in that area is very happy uh, about Tiller being gone. I'm not sure if there are implications to that, that basically someone from my point of view wouldn't uh, pay attention to. So maybe we're losing some functionality. Maybe there's something that was convenient and we took for granted and now it's gone. That is something that I, I actually would like to study and just to be sure. Uh, but from my point of view of the tooling side and basically the developer side, uh, everyone's just happy about Helm tree and I, th I think there's going to be an issue with this migration because Helm 3 came out not too long ago and Helm 2 is going away already. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people take time to migrate. So that's going to be rough. I think a lot of people, like, we are the Kubernetes people. We are at KubeCon. We know what's going on. But I think the day Helm 2 shuts off, let's say, uh, a lot of people are going to learn that that was a thing because their stuff broke in production. Um, so yeah, that's unfortunate, but I'm sure it's going to happen to some people. And the funny thing, I guess, is if uh, if Tiller goes to restart in January, um, the images won't be available on on GCR where they were previously hosted. They're going to be migrated somewhere else, and so at that point, people will um, go to uh, maybe apply an update or do a rollback, and they'll notice that Tiller Tiller is not responsive. Um, at which point. That migration is going to happen quick. Now, luckily for them, Helm 2 to Helm 3 migration, super easy. Um, I think I've done it like six times now. Uh, and every time it was, I mean, it was like like a, in order of minutes project. And it was very, very slick. So I was very, very impressed with uh, the work they've done there. Um, I feel like some, of the, some of the problem, you know, what I think about is the era for Helm 2 and the era for the users that were adopting it and the vendors that they were engaging with to build their helm charts for their stuff internally or whatever and perhaps those vendors are not around perhaps those consultants are not working for them anymore and so they have some some of these organizations may have no clue that they need to upgrade just this one little thing that they paid someone to do real quick for them because mm -hmm. of kubernetes oh uh, actually before we move on from the helm topic we do have a question from uh, dave nielsen who says any improvements in Helm 3 or on the tooling side to help users deploy easier like Docker Compose? For example, Docker Compose can dramatically improve the deployment of a microservice-based app on a developer's laptop. If not, do your guests have any suggestions to help improve deployment experience for developers with Helm charts? And I feel like Ellen, after watching your talk, that this was like, you're like just ready to knock this one out. Yeah, do you want the full pitch here or just the overview? <laughs> Let, let's. Uh, why don't Why don't you give uh, give a give a two minute here, and, and it'll be it'll be kind of our transition point into the the topic of, of your talk and our our discussion. Okay. Here. Yeah. So Docker Compose to me, uh, it's a it's a bit like a previous generation of tooling kind of a thing. It's like okay, we realize that there are issues with the developer experience. Let's do something that's gonna work, but like 
It was an early thing. It was like, okay, there's a problem. Let's just, you know, try to put some duct tape here. I mean, not to disparage uh, the project itself. It's great, but it, it came from a, an earlier time. Nowadays, we have a whole, um, a whole new class of tooling to deal with developer experience that you just didn't uh, in, the, in the very near past. So I call them MDX, like uh, multi-service developer experience, so MDX tools, MDX platforms. I just made up that acronym. It's never going to catch on. But anyway, um, so there are many tools. So one of them is Tilt, uh, which, I, which is the, the tool from the company I work for. Um, the previous company I worked for was Garden, which also does tooling in this, uh, in this realm. Uh, then there's Scaffold, which is probably the best known. There's Draft, uh, which is abandoned now. At some point, there was Forge from DataWire. There's Telepresence, which people talk a lot uh, at CNCF events because I, I think they made it a CNCF project. But Telepresence is also a bit like a previous generation kind of a thing. Um, so there's a lot of tooling. There are many new things like Octato and I don't know, it's like every week someone else uh, pops up that's in this round. So generally what these tools do, the objective is to have an instant feedback loop. Uh, that is the main goal and then it grows from that goal. So generally right now you save your file, like you're, you're writing code, you make a change to your code, you save your file. Let's say now this red button is going to turn green or whatever, anything you want. Uh, the general workflow right now is you package up a new image uh, with Docker, you ship the image to a registry, you tell Kubernetes, hey, kubectl apply something, something, uh, start using the new image. That's what people usually do nowadays. It's a pain in the butt. You lose concentration from what you're working on. It takes time. Uh, it's generally, I mean, it works. It's just not convenient. It's like writing code with Notepad instead of an ID, basically. Um, so with these tools, and I'm not talking about Tilt, I'm talking about the whole category, so don't go uh, yell at me that it's a product pitch. Uh, what these tools generally do is they monitor uh, your code and you set it up with like a config file or something like that. They monitor your project. Every time you make a change to your code, uh, it automates the whole thing. So as a developer, what I do is I write my code, I save my file, uh, I look out the window for a second, and then uh, everything is up and running. I just refresh the browser, or if it's a backend stuff, you know, I use curl again or anything you want. And, and then the whole, the whole game here is you automate everything you can out of the developer's way. Uh, you take every manual step out of existence, at least from a developer's perspective, so that they can write code, save the file, blink your eyes, and it's live. And that is basically the journey that uh, my company, my previous company, and everyone else in this uh, uh, emerging niche uh, are trying to achieve. Yeah, that's a, that's a great overview. And I, I posted a link in the chat to uh, your talk on the schedule. And um, yeah, just, the, just, to, just to round it up to the, the question that, what was the person's name? Um, uh, Dave. Yeah, that Dave had asked. Uh, Lots of these tools have integrations with Realm. So uh, Tilt has, Garden has, uh, I, I don't know about Helm specifically for the other tools, but I would assume that most of them have Helm integrations. So what was the, uh, you mentioned in your talk that there's a cool tool that does uh, Kubernetes like for CI. So it's kind of meant, because a lot of people use Docker Compose in their CI pipelines, for example, just because like spinning up a whole cluster doesn't work. And you mentioned a tool that people are starting to use for Kubernetes cluster testing. Um, I can't remember what it was though. Um, it's a bit of a broad question. I'm not sure which thing exactly you meant. So there are some different workflows. Uh, for example, uh, some people, they use these tools to basically pull their CI image locally uh, or to like inside the development cluster. And then you can basically do all of your testing as you develop. Um, it's kind of a tricky thing, but some people do that. Um, you can also run some of these tools inside CI. Uh, so for example, you, you make a code change and CI rebuilds the whole thing using that kind of workflow, which sometimes is dependency aware. So like instead of testing everything, you test just the thing you changed and that's faster. Uh, I'm not sure I'm getting exactly to what you were uh, referring to in the talk, but but I, and I think Austin, did you have a comment here as well? Oh no, it was, it was just a comment about tilt. Um, plus one to tilt. Uh, we had 
I've used it before. I really like it. We had um, a hackathon at our offices like last year uh, until it was very early and did a POC like moving our uh, dev experience over to it and it worked really well. Uh, so I just wanted to say if anyone's looking for something like <laughs> shout that. Out, shout out for Tilt. Shout out to Tilt. Well, and great and customer I, service too. We're going to go just maybe a little bit deeper on this. Um, I had kind of a funny experience yesterday, and I mentioned at the top of the hour that I was going to have to eat crow. Uh, and so yesterday, um, I was talking with my team, and uh, one of the one of the guys on my team, Costas, was tweeting out and, and sharing, um, was watching your talk live, Ellen, and he was sharing uh, bits of it. And he said, oh, this is a really good talk. And he pinged me, and he said, hey, you got to watch this. It's a great talk. And so I load it up. I start watching the talk. And there's a section at the very beginning where you talk about kind of different approaches to Kubernetes, you know, application development. And you're like, oh, a lot of people use their laptops. And then they kind of, sometimes they run into issues because maybe it's not powered enough. Da, da, da. And, and I got to that part of the talk and I thought, oh yeah, that's a really good point. And I opened up a Twitter window and I said, great talk from Ellen. Uh, the default approach to building these Kubernetes applications to set up a local cluster. And that's really the worst cloud imaginable. So I, I type that into Twitter, I hit enter, I send, and I turn back to the presentation. And about a minute later, you pull up this slide. And I'm staring at this <laughs> slide that says, Kubernetes on laptop is fine, very emphatically. And I think, huh, oh, this talk isn't actually going quite in the direction that I thought it was going in. This is really interesting. And I think, oh, maybe I should go delete that tweet because it doesn't really, like it's kind of not the direction that you're going. And I look back over here and I see a notification in my Twitter and I have a response <laughs> and it's from you. And you're saying, this is absolutely not what I said in the talk. And then I, I was of course backpedaling and I, I, uh, I felt bad because at that point it was so awkward and I kind of misrepresented your talk. So I apologize for that. I should have uh, maybe finished the talk. Sometimes I tweet about talks before I finish them. So anyway, you're very gracious to come on and kind to come on and, and talk after I, I basically uh, misrepresented your talk. So I apologize. No, nah, man, I, I'm not gracious. I'm here to prove you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> How could you, Dan? How could you? <laughs> no, yeah, I, I think like, let, let's just uh, go back a few steps and just explain uh, for the audience uh, what this was. So there's this, there's this thing that, uh, you know, when you come back a little bit, like I was talking about Docker Compose, um, people realized, okay, developing for Kubernetes is annoying because of, you know, all of these reasons, what can we do? And then I think Minikube was the first one that you could easily run on your computer, on your laptop, the first uh, like cluster emulator or whatever is the actual name for that. And it's a bit heavy, it's sluggish, it eats up a lot of RAM. Um, and then people, you know, this meme came up that, oh, if you try to run Kubernetes on your laptop, it's gonna set your laptop on fire. But I mean, people were trying to run things on their laptop that they shouldn't. They're trying to run things on their laptop that they should be running on, on a remote cluster with infinite RAM, infinite processing, infinite storage. And people are trying to cram way too much stuff into a laptop using like, you know, an early version of what we have today. So. Uh, if we forward a few years, uh, look at what we have today. We have mini cubes, we have micro K, we have Kind, we have K3S, we have Docker for desktop, you know, for Mac, Windows, etc. Um, they're all different. They all are good at some things and bad at some other things. So it's like if you're trying to use the wrong tool for the job, it's not going to work. And there's a the matter of scale. If you try to run Netflix on your laptop, it's not going to work. If you're trying to run a small app on your laptop, it's gonna be fine. Uh, and that's where I really, I really hate the jokes about Kubernetes is gonna set your laptop on fire because people give that advice like it's good advice. Oh, don't use Kubernetes on your laptop. That's bad, that's bad developer experience. But hey, I, I'm working with companies who have been using uh, Kubernetes on the laptop for years and they're happy because their apps are the right scale to run on the laptop. And guess what? If you run it on the laptop, you don't need to pay a cloud provider. Uh, setup is so much easier. You don't need the person who's like, you know, the GCP expert or, you know, the AWS guru or something. You double click the thing. It's running on your computer. It just works. If you're using the right kind of local cluster and running an app that is the right scale, 
it's a win. So when people give that advice, oh, don't run Kubernetes on your laptop, it's going to set it on fire, blah, 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 you know, that whole meme. Uh, sometimes that's just bad advice for, for lots of people. And of course, that's not the case for, you know, uh, all of us who are working with huge, large scale things. But for a certain scale, running it on your laptop is actually the best case scenario. And yeah, everyone knows it's not Kubernetes on the laptop that kills you, it's Kafka. <laughs> uh, Walid actually pointed out, he said, GitLab, Azure, Dev servers, all these different companies, they're really encouraging centralized development um, on a centralized cluster. Uh, and of course they are cloud providers, so they are interested in selling more compute time. Um, you actually brought up, uh, in, I think it was during the Q&A, Alan, a really interesting pattern that you've seen emerge where people essentially have a dev slash staging cluster where each engineer has their own namespace. And then they have a mm -hmm. staging instance in its own namespace and every developer is is developing against the staging namespace for all their interdependent mm -hmm. dependent microservices. I thought that was really cool pattern and um, would love to see more of that. Yeah, I first saw this pattern with uh, Datadog. Uh, I hadn't seen anyone like mention it before. I'm sure someone else was doing it before, but it's the first time someone explicitly mentioned that. I found it really cool. I, I don't know the specifics of how exactly they're implementing this, but I found it was amazing. Uh, it's a really good idea. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And thank you for that. And uh, please do check out uh, Ellen's talk. Uh, it, I, I thought it was very good, even though I uh, started talking about it before I finished it. Um, I finished it uh, uh, during that discussion and, and still thought it was very good. So. Check that out. And another thing that I actually wanted to mention that uh, I think you just launched, Ellen, is this uh, dex.dev, which is a, a website all focused on developer experience. Um, and I thought this was really cool and actually very much to the problems that Dave brought up earlier about developer experience. And I think this just did this just launch like this week? Yeah, uh, I think it launched on Tuesday. No, we put it online on Monday and then we we're still fixing it. So we didn't do like a big push yet. Uh, there are still some little bugs there. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna do basically videos and, um, and live streams. We're gonna try to publish something new every week. And yeah, the focus, cool. yeah, and the focus is, you know, developers. I, I like happy developers. I like developers who are focused on, you know, the creative parts of their work and not in typing kubectl commands. Uh, and yeah, so the first video we have now, it's basically a, an introduction, like why is this important? Um, the second video that we're working on is gonna be an overview of all those different types of clusters. So, okay, why should I use kind instead of micro case for this project, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's also one about using Helm versus customize. So, okay, how do you deal with 100 billion config files? Use a templating solution. Should I use Helm? Should I use customize? It depends. Uh, so we're going to go into that. And, and you know, there's a lot more stuff as well uh, that we're going to get oh, to well, in the future. I'm excited to follow it and uh, I love the work you're doing. Um, I want to bring the discussion into a place uh, for some of our other panelists. Um, there was another piece of news announced today that I feel like kind of went a little bit under the radar. Uh, the Linux Foundation just launched a new foundation called FinOps. And the purpose of this is essentially to bring a practice, I'm reading it, it is the practice of bringing financial accountability to the variable spend model of cloud, enabling distributed teams to make business trade-offs between speed, cloud, and quality. So I wanted to start with you, Alex, and then maybe go to uh, Matt about your thoughts on the FinOps Foundation that's launching. I, I don't know a lot about it, I do know that it's primarily for the people who are managing the costs of trying to figure out their, you know, their, their cloud service deployments. And one of the founders, um, do you guys know the name of the founder? It's, it's escaping me now. Uh, he came from uh, one of the, uh, from Cloudability, uh, the company that provided uh, kind of a, a way to kind of account for your cloud costs. And this is just becoming a bigger issue for, for people as we all well know, you know. Uh, I think it came up in uh, the issue around uh, cluster sprawl in the presentation that IBM did about, you know, how you might just forget about a cluster and it just keeps racking up uh, 
um, you know, uh, charges. And before you know it, you might have several thousand dollars um, to account for. And that's not unusual. Uh, but just understanding how to manage the cloud costs alone, you see people like Corey Quinn getting lots of attention because he's able to help you understand, you know, what exactly you are paying for. And so this seems to be a, a discussion that uh, is, is going to grow in importance is just as more resources are used. Uh, you know, yeah. it, that's really about it from my perspective. Yeah, I'm kind of here. I, I, you know, I saw this on the calendar um, and the, the FinOps summit and thought that was interesting. Um, I didn't, I didn't attend, uh, but you know, I can see things like starting to see open source projects around um, show back, charge back type of things. So I can actually, um, so let's take, take that namespace breakdown. How much is my team costing me inside of my cluster and that cluster is shared by multiple teams. You know, it'll be interesting to see the open source projects that come out of this. I see that, you know, VMware is part of this. So I'm wondering if they're gonna move towards, cause they do have like Cloud Health, um, I think is a licensed product from, uh, from VMware. And I'm curious if they're gonna move towards, will we see a uh, Tanzu uh, contribution where we now have show back charge back for Kubernetes clusters and Kubernetes objects. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I, I mean, didn't see AWS's name on here. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's talk about Google Cloud Compute Billing PM being on this, which seems very much like having the foxes guard the hen house. <laughs> I, I, mean, I was going to say, the... Austin, it's a bit like having a, a foundation for helping people to stop gamb gambling that includes a casino. Right. It... What's wrong with that? <laughs> That's your view on this, actually? That's it's interesting. Uh, well, actually, I mean, I, I think that the admission, the, the, the fact that Google Cloud is on here makes sense, given that they're, uh, they're looking for any kind of advantage that's going to help them really get a toehold in this market. AWS yeah. not being present makes sense because they are probably thinking, eh, we'll adopt this stuff when you make us, but we're not in a rush. That's my idea. If I had to guess, each company in this list has a stake in the game of keeping FinOps a licensed product that they sell out to their customers versus any type of open source is going to be free for all. Yeah, I I foresee, I, I have, despite my, my personal misgivings and skepticism about um, the nature of like a, founda a foundation to save you money, <clears throat> I think <laughs> the bigger thing point. is that I would expect to see more movement like this, not just from uh, discrete cloud operators, but also SaaS companies in general. I believe uh, in the face of economic contractions and other uncertainty in sort of the, the sales cycle, what you're gonna see is this realization that you can't build a successful, you can't build a long-term successful business off of like really short run um, cycles, right? Like you can't, like the B2C thing will work great to get you out of the, you know, to get you that first hundred or thousand customers. But when you start talking about real money and you start talking about like sustaining business operations, then things change and now it becomes more of a price game and you can't just tell your sales team, hey, infinite discounts forever, right? So I think you'll see more features and more products and more SKUs from existing SaaS players to try and compete on a, like, hey, here's a dynamic pricing thing, or hey, here's a chargeback thing, or, or even taking a page from Slack, right? Which, which does true up billing on seats and services and letting you to do like dynamic- Yeah, Slack's uh, getting a lot of good billing models. With that. Yeah, and I mean, at some point they'll stop doing that. <clears throat> But until that point, right, like as long as you're in a market where there's several or there are there is competition, uh, especially from incumbents or established players, then you got to have something. And we're, we're not in the it's it's not 2000 uh, anymore. You can't just do steak dinners and big checks like you have to. Everyone is becoming more penny conscious. And so I think that this is a, a dark look, this, this is a dark portent of where a lot of people will probably be spending their engineering time in the future. But I also think that maybe it will be the darkness before the dawn in terms of uh, 
a better understanding of like what is the, what do things actually cost and how do you account for externalities in those costs like co2 or climate mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. Uh, great comments and uh, good discussion. Our next topic um, is uh, actually, uh, well, I feel bad. This one might not strike you as strictly KubeCon related, but it came up in several conversations that I had with people. Um, Docker Hub deprecating their free and basically garbage collecting any images older than six months. Uh, is this the the container apocalypse, or is this not that big of a deal? Uh, and why don't we start with you, Ellen? Sounds to me like uh, that's the FinOps in action there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so but, somebody at Docker noticed that, noticed the cost. The, the FinOps Foundation's cost. first success. I mean, now that the whole world depends on containers, why should we foot the bill? Let's just pull the plug and let someone else pick it up. Uh, sounds like a, sounds like a, you know, the classical maximize shareholder value mantra. So, mm -hmm. hooray, capitalism! <laughs> wait, so wait. As a, almost as an aside, who actually owns? Is this Marantis then? Do they own that, or is I, I don't think that's the section of the business that Marantis took. Okay. No. Oh, this okay. I, I could be wrong though. See, that's part of the problem like here. We have no clue who owns Docker anymore. Like, well, yeah, yeah, Docker is. They they sold off essentially their entire server business, which I think was basically anybody who was paying for like Docker Swarm and kind of their Docker Enterprise stuff, which I don't think included DockerCon. But I could be totally wrong on that. I don't have any insider information. Suckers. Huh. <laughs> Uh, the real winner here, I think, is going to be GitHub, though, uh, because like GitHub that. does have a Docker registry. And if you are on open source, uh, it is free 95. So Microsoft's the winner. As many as you want. Yeah, I guess Microsoft's yeah. the real winner then. Well, they're the winner until someone from the office side of the business decides to become CEO again, and then we all lose. <laughs> Strong, strong Microsoft sentiment in this room. I, I, you know what I like? I, I think Microsoft has done some great stuff. I am amazed that for people, I don't, like I'm it's wild to think about them, the transformation that's gone on there, right? Uh, have well, we're going to, we're going to move into our favorites section of this discussion. Uh, favorite talks, favorite topics, favorite tracks, or just favorite, um, favorite uh, discussions that you've had. And the one that I'll call out um, is actually one that came up yesterday during our discussion, but I had a chance to go actually watch the talk and um, was just really blown away by it. This was a talk given by, uh, oh, I had all the notes on it here. Shoot, I lost them. Uh, it was uh, by Monzo Bank and it's called Banking on Kubernetes the Hard Way in Production with Miles Grant and Suhai Patel. And they talked about um, their journey and, and it was just a grab bag of war stories. And it's just the kind of talk that I really love, all these different war stories, all these different lessons learned. They've been using Kubernetes and prod and they, they decided that they needed to uh, basically implement a security policy for every single service. And they have over 500, 600 services, microservices across you know, many, many clusters. And so what they did is they implemented um, using, uh, uh, they, they basically implemented a policy that wouldn't actually enforce, but then in combination with IP tables, they could actually uh, log every packet that would be lost in the event that that policy actually took place. And then they basically just worked every day and just modified their policy until this graph basically went down to zero because they were able to create policies that, that met everything. Very cool talk, covers a ton of stuff. Um, highly recommend this talk. Um, what are uh, what are your favorite talks or topics or tracks? And uh, anyone that wants to go first, I like the uh, I like the keynotes today in particular. Uh, the uh, discussion about uh, Pinterest and their experiences. Uh, I thought uh, Vicky uh, did a great job with. Uh, usability and the importance of usability. And then Constance uh, Karamanalis, I believe that's right, um, had another discussion about just the importance of documentation. So 
today's talks were, were, were right on. I thought the pitches talk was particularly interesting in the value that they get from, from Envoy. And, you know, with all the discussions about service mesh, the clear winner, it, at least from my, can, from my, my seat is Envoy. Envoy really is, um, the, is that technology architecture that really is having an impact. That was exactly the consensus yesterday was that no matter who is, who's in the game, Envoy is winning. Yeah. Matt, what did you think? I haven't watched all my talks yet today, but I will continue to pitch the talk tracks that I follow, which are uh, ML track right now and storage mm. are the ones I'm following. Um, I'm looking forward to the Spock talk today. Um, and I think there's only th two ML talks today, three ML talks that work today. Uh, so I have to stream those. I haven't watched those yet. Um, I'd love to hear about Austin's opinion on the observability talks, though, and what, what he learned from those. Yeah. Um, so uh, staying in my lane, I, I've mostly been focusing on the observability talks uh, because I'm, I'm always very interested to hear about people using open telemetry, uh, which is a project I work on. And it's been really... It's been really kind of, I guess, rewarding is a good way to say it, because I think that, you know, for a project that's not even, you know, that is still sandbox or what's sandbox, what's the earliest one? But for a project that hasn't even really kind of gotten up to that second little tier in the CNCF, like seeing the amount of people that have open telemetry in production are using it every day for, you know, millions and millions and millions of telemetry events um, using it to kind of understand and observe their systems is really exciting. I think there's one particular, uh, what was the name? It's from a guy at Shopify and it's like the last talk in the observability track for the day if you want to go back and look for it. But he was talking about their kind of journey to imp implementing open telemetry and uh, some really exciting stuff he was talking about with actually that they're working on by taking their telemetry data, so their, their traces and spans, I'm sorry, their traces and metrics, and then exporting them to, you know, some sort of a data store, like a GCS bucket, where they could then consume them into BigQuery and have engineers or have people build their own visualizations off of, you know, raw trace data. Mm. And I think that's something that right now, you know, you need to go, you know, you, you need to go and pay a vendor for, which... <clears throat> I mean, a vendor signs their paycheck, so I'm not going to like uh, dismiss that too much. But I do think what's what's really impressive is the idea that a lot of this sort of really interesting analytical stuff that previously has not been in the open source world, mm -hmm. you know, we'll start to see people implementing those sort of solutions and and breaking us kind of out of this weird do my try whatever opoly of you know monitoring and observability being something that you have to kind of go pay a bunch of money for and have it be something that, no, you can kind of do this just using off the shelf open source components. That That's actually a good, I want to get uh, more favorites uh, though, before we do another piece of news was that the project Thanos moved from sandbox to in incubation, which is uh, essentially my understanding is this is scalable enterprise grade Thanos, kind of on the topic that you were talking about Austin, not directly tracing, but the observability aspect and kind of bringing it together. I thought this was actually really cool news. I haven't tried Thanos yet, um, and I have very little experience with Prometheus, but wanted to, um, that was cool news that they're moving to incubation and uh, worth definitely checking out. I'm, I'm excited to do that. Yeah, so it's Ellen, really an exciting one. Prometheus, you're gonna, oh, yeah. need, you're gonna use Thanos with Prometheus if you're gonna do this in production. Yeah. Um, this we'll this is gonna like be, this. this is gonna be the most random comment ever, but if you can read Cyrillic, that logo is really confusing because that N looks exactly like a P in Cyrillic. <laughs> so it's Thapos? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this would be a better name for like a NoSQL database or something though, because, and then you lost half your data. I actually thought, yeah, I would thought, yeah, that's weird that they named I should it. play my rim, I have a rim shot button on my stream deck and I should be using that for my notes. <laughs> Kind of well, lucky that I'm not. well, I actually was wondering this morning, I was like, oh, could they get sued for using the name Thanos? And it turns out it's a Greek name. So it's not like, it's not. Yeah, I think there's, some, there's some prior art there. There's prior art. <laughs> uh, 
Um, uh, any other uh, favorites uh, or call outs that people want to make to either topics or talks or even speakers? Uh, I, I didn't get to watch most of my most of the talks I wanted to yet, but I'm just really excited about the whole security uh, stuff popping up now. So uh, Valid mentioned uh, Ian's talk, uh, which I'm really looking forward to watch. Uh, Sysdig had lots of cool talks as well. The whole EVPF uh, security stuff, like that, that's the stuff. I'm so excited to learn everything about that. This was Sysdig's talk? Yeah. Hats off to Chris Nova. She did a really good job in her keynote. Uh, and who was she paired with? It was actually, she was with a customer and uh, really kind of brought it home. What was Shane the value Lawrence of? of Shopify? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. this is the day one keynote that you're talking about. Right. Yeah, great call out. Great call out. I think Ellen mentioned it, but also just another shout out for Ian Coldwater's talk on uh, persistent threats in Kubernetes. Yeah, we're currently implementing honk mode on Tilt uh, to pay tribute for the, you know, awesome. our security friends. <laughs> this is this one, the advanced uh, persistence threats. Yeah. Just post that in the chat. Have yeah, with uh, Ian Coldwater and Brad Gieson and, oh yeah, Heroku and Darkbit, cool. I'll add that to my uh, talks to watch here. Um, and I believe that we are, you know, we're nearing the end of the hour. And uh, of course, this is the end of KubeCon. All of the talks have gone forward. I was sitting there watching a talk and I got a notification that said, that's a wrap. We're done. Go home. And I thought I, we're going to finish this talk before I leave. But uh, but uh, we're looking now forward to KubeCon um, Boston, which is... Uh, I don't know if it's officially virtual yet, but I think it it's is. like 90. It is. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it is, it is virtual. Um, I will say one thing that I liked about the virtual conference was that I actually felt like I could participate more, like that North America actually participated more than they would have otherwise, because they were able to connect in and stream and talks. Um, I do miss the hallway track, which maybe this panel is filling. Um, Boston, I think is happening in November, right? Uh, yeah, November. So um, any thoughts looking forward to Boston, things that you hope they do different, topics that you think we get deeper on? Um, and and uh, yeah, go anybody who wants to shout out, shout out. Uh, yeah, you should watch all the AppDev track uh, talks because the chairs are amazing. Are you one of the chairs? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I think the booths should go. I don't know yeah. if you have any similar experiences with the booths, but I think the Slack channel is really where the where the where the meat of the discussions mm -hmm. took place. And someone on our team was suggesting why don't they just give like a Slack channel to every sponsor, you know, so you could at least then have conversations with people as they come in. Um, they did. They did. I can tell they, you why actually? Why? Because by uh, because according to the terms of service, by clicking any piece of sponsored content, that counts as a badge swipe. So it's really entirely about giving sponsors lead lists. Yeah, so for example, if I go to Noble9, uh, of course, Kit was on a few days ago. By clicking like into it, over it, I got a scan, basically. So I'm on their list. Yeah. Um, I think even hovering might count. Oh, crazy. That's awesome. <laughs> And uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll say from a sponsor perspective, because we, we've long sponsored KubeCon and um, you know always had a big booth and always had lobbies and lounges and all that stuff. We actually just didn't feel like we could quite make it work with KubeCon Europe this year. Um, so we, we ended up not doing that. And I do like the Slack channel idea, um, but the, the tricky thing about that and that, that is what, what really happened in this conference is that anybody that was having really good discussions was doing it in Slack. Um, the challenge there, of course, is that breaking off for sideline discussions is difficult. You have to like try to wrench people away from the main channel. And then of course, uh, you know, if a sponsor, like, you know, um, what's to, why wouldn't a sponsor necessarily go hang out in a competitor's channel and be like, oh, you know, actually I don't think it's that cool, da, 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 you know? and. I, I, well, I worry no about breaks, that kind of stuff. Right? 
the, the the flow isn't there like in a normal in person thing. It's like oh, you have your breaks, you go, you eat your, you eat your granola bar and your free coffee, and you um, get less food into a booth. And when you're at home and you don't have that, like it's I don't think anyone's figured out sponsor. Like I, I I will say I don't think there has been a single virtual event that has figured out how to do sponsors right or or do right by them. Um, but that's that's my take. No, it's like sponsoring a TV show, it's just a different thing. Yeah, but I on and honestly, like maybe that should just be the model, right? Is that you pay a thousand bucks and you get your logo up and you get exactly the same amount of engagement from people. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what you've done here is pretty is is a good example of what more sponsors could do. Is by Alex. No. Don't don't tell other people to come come compete with us. This is a, it's a terrible <laughs> idea. It's too hard to do. Don't do it. No, but I think that I think there's a real value in when the sponsors actually produce actually helpful, informative material. And it doesn't have to be a format like this, but it's just anything. And that, you know, if you can like use a channel then to move people to another channel where they have to, you know, or they they have the you know understanding that. Hey, I'm participating in this value valuable discussion. Yeah, I'm going to say it's okay to talk to me at some point, or yeah. at least be on their list. It seems to me like the content is the is the key. Yeah, I think like commercials and like an op, like a commercials and like an opt in sort of hey, I'd like to know more is, is a good strategy. Um, but I, I think all of these virtual event platforms that try to mirror or try to act as like abstractions over what a physical event is like the the general yeah you know i'm not going to mince words like if you read twitter uh, especially the first day when people kind of just got in and they're looking at the ui and it's just like oh no this feels bad snow um crash. yeah very snow crash right like not to promote my own thing but i, I i'm the guy that did the animal crossing conference back in April and everyone loved it because it was something different. It was unique. It's innovative, right? Take advantage of the constraints. Yeah. Don't just try to um, do real world thing, but now we're on Zoom, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. it's a, a kind of an uncanny valley. I, um, I, I will say one cool crown. thing. Oh, I want to come back to you, Matt. Uh, one cool thing I noticed is that because the talks are all online now, uh, they all have the transcripts posted. So you yeah. can actually just pull up the transcripts and just, if you'd rather just read the talk, you can actually just read through the talk really quickly. I thought that was really cool. Uh, what That's were you going to say, Matt? That's really good. Oh, yeah, that doesn't matter. <laughs> That's just going to make a comment. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, for the vendors, I, I'm kind of curious about the channel, multi-channel, but I'm waiting for the first person to write a bot that harvests all the Slack conversations from all of their competing vendors and dumps it into a file for themselves so they can go and do intel on conversations that happen between engineers who are the top engineers who are representing those companies. I mean, it's a treasure trove of information for, for others. Oh yeah, you could very easily just go check and see, oh, who's uh, who's talking to my competitor over here? Oh, sounds like they're in market. So There's a startup fun in there story. <laughs> Hop in, if you've seen the Hop in digital event platform, has exports available from like every channel. So if you're an organizer, you can just export all the conversations from even the sponsor channels. Whoa. It, wow. It's, yeah, it's creepy. It's Panopticon, right? Like, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't like it. Well, on you, that. How did you manage sponsorships in Animal Crossing, or did you not? I just said, hey, if you uh, promote, if you like tweet about the event, then I'll put your logo on a uh, interstitial page, and like gave people a shout out, you know, like. But I, again, it's like a commercial, right? It's basically saying, hey, thanks for uh, promoting this. We're gonna say your name, and you're a cool person for doing this, you know, which is about as good, you know. Which I feel like the I don't know if anyone got leads off of it, but. Uh, 15,000 people saw their logo. That's worth Well, saying. Austin, you're you're getting the last word because we are at the end of the hour. I know that there's more discussion exactly. to be had. I really appreciate you all joining. Maybe the next PoopCon will be in Fortnite. If it's good enough to announce key plot points in Star Wars movies, maybe it's good enough for Kubernetes. And with that, thanks again, everybody. Uh, please watch, uh, watch Twitter uh, at CodeFresh or at Today Was Awesome, which is myself. Find our, our wonderful uh, speakers today on Twitter and follow them as well. Lots of excellent work being done. 
And thank you again. If you have any other questions or follow, please feel free, feel free to reach out and hit us up. Um, and with that, I am Dan Garfield, and we are done with the KubeCon EU debrief. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye.